chapter of the book of Revelation, and this morning we are going to talk about the bittersweet gospel. Yes, the honeycomb is certainly there, but so is the bitterness, and this is a one of those uh, juxtapositions where we have uh, the honey, which is very sweet, balanced against the judgment, which is uh, certainly bitter. Uh, like Debbie said, it, if you uh, look at the Word of God, it is certainly sweet as honey when you're saved. But the judgment, if you're not saved, is not so sweet. Well, Revelation chapter 10, we're going to look at the first 11 verses of this chapter. And this is an interlude. Interludes are a wonderful thing. You know what an interlude is. It's a space when you don't do anything, when you wait. Um, Interludes allow you to do some things. They allow you to catch your breath. You know, there's an interlude in a musical piece where the singer is allowed to draw your breath, right? That little interlude is a great thing. It catches you, you can catch your breath. If you've got a big brother and you're still little, uh, an interlude would be a good thing. It allows you to catch up because he's got longer legs and he can take bigger steps. At concerts, interludes are a wonderful thing in between pieces because that gives Elizabeth a chance to explain the music to me. Uh, TV commercials are like interludes. I have the sound and I've saved lots of money. Interludes are a wonderful thing. In Revelation chapter 10, the entire chapter and half of the next chapter, chapter 11, this is an interlude. It's a break in the action. It's John's commentary on what's transpired so far. In the middle of the judgment seals and the trumpets sounding as God begins to pour down his wrath, we have this brief pause of a chapter and a half to catch our breath. And in this chapter and a half, particularly these first 11 verses of chapter 10, we have, a, we have assurances as preparation points for the balance of the judgment time. It's almost like God is giving us a little bit of a break to catch our breath before the rest of it shows up. What of these, what are these three assurances? The tribulation saints, first of all, are assured that it's not going to be a much longer time. What are tribulation saints? You remember the rapture of the church is going to occur. That's the next great event in history, the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ. Um, some people would point to a war and say that's the next great event, or a uh, peace treaty, that's the next great event. The next great event in God's history is the rapture of the church. That begins the seven year period known as the Great Tribulation. We'll get into how it's broken down, because it is broken down in three and a half year segments, and there is certain significance to that. But for our purposes today, let's remember that the next great event is the tribulation, uh, the rapture of the church, which begins the tribulation of seven years. And there are some people that are going to give their hearts to Jesus during that time. Mostly it's going to be Jews. Uh, a lot of people think that it's going to be both Jews and Gentiles. I'm among those people. I think Jews and Gentiles will both be saved during that time. I do not for any any sense of the word, believe that everybody is going to be saved during that time because scripture does not support that. But the tribulation saints, the ones who are saved after the rapture, there they are on planet earth and the great tribulation is what? It's tribulation. It's tough times. It's rough. It's bad. It is horrible. We've been talking about that and, and some of the judgment that God's going to pour on the earth. What about these people that give their hearts to Jesus after the rapture and the tribulation begins? Well, these saints are going to be assured it's not going to be much longer. Now listen, when you're suffering, seven years is a long time, is it not? I mean, seven minutes for some of us would be a long time in real suffering. Uh, when I got stunned Monday, <laughs> I want to tell you, I, I, I was thinking the great tribulation had happened. Those little buggers really didn't sing. In the tribulation time, it's going to be awful, but they are the saints are going to be assured that it will not be much longer. Secondly, the martyred saints, the ones who are killed during that time, and there will be that, those who accept Jesus during the tribulation time, 
when they stand up for Jesus during that time, uh, Scripture tells us that they are going to be martyred. They are going to be killed for their faith. Just like in ancient times when the church was first getting off the ground in Rome and uh, in the Colosseum particularly, what happened there? Christians were herded out into the middle of the Colosseum and the lions were let loose. I mean, uh, there was terrible, terrible persecution. It's going to be like that during the tribulation time. Thirdly, God's authority and God's sovereignty are going to be highlighted or underlined during this time of tribulation. So, this chapter describes the beginning of the great tribulation for us, and we want to ask the question, what kind of time is that going to be? Well, first of all, it's going to be a shortened time. It's going to be a condensed time. Revelation chapter 10, verses 1 through 3. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, surrounded by a cloud with a rainbow over his head. His face shone like the sun, and his feet were like pillars of fire. And in his hand was a small scroll that had been opened. He stood with his right foot on the sea, and his left foot on the land. And he gave a, sh a great shout like the roar of a lion. And when he shouted, the seven thunders answered. The angel has a little book in his hand. Actually, when the Bible says book, it's a little scroll. So he's got a little rolled up piece of paper in his hand. The shortness of time that this is going to take is indicated by the brevity of this account. This next chapter and a half is rather brief, but also the assurance is given that it's not going to be very long. But verse 6, by the way, compared to eternity, how long is seven years? It's not like that, right? How long, according to history, well, whether you're a shorter, a young earth or an old earth person, if you're a young earth person, 6,000 years versus seven years, that's hardly a footnote, right? But if you're an old earth person, it's uh, even less than that. Well, in verse 6 of this chapter, the angel reaffirms that this whole event is not going to be plagued by delays. Not going to be hurry up and wait. Everything is going to happen quickly. And the reason of this is simple. When God's judgment begins, nobody can stand for long. When God's judgment begins, nobody can withstand God's judgment. Job in the Old Testament, the oldest book of the Bible, Job chapter 42, verse 3, Job recognized this. Job is speaking to God. He's responding to a question God has asked. God asks this question. Who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorance? And Job speaks up and he says, it was me. It was me. And I was talking about things I didn't know about, things far too wonderful for me. There's just something about being in the presence of God that will humble you, especially when God is ticked. Who can stand when God speaks? It's a good thing that these days are going to be shortened. Jesus said that in his last sermon, Matthew chapter 24. In fact, unless that time of calamity is shortened, Jesus said, not a single person will survive. But it will be shortened for the sake of God's chosen ones. When the Lord speaks, his word is always accomplished. Didn't God say, let there be, and there was? Let there be light, and there was. Let there be seas, and there was. And so this angel stands with one foot on land and the other foot on the sea, and he's claiming something by that stance. What he's claiming is that everything that exists belongs to God just as recorded by the psalmist. In Psalm 24, verse 1, it says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all its people belong to him. The creator owns everything. When the angel, when the angel speaks here, his voice is like the intimidating roar of a lion. Have you ever stood next to a lion when it roars? I hope there were bars in between you. I mean, that's, that's the only experience I have with it. We're in the zoo in Florida somewhere, St. Petersburg or something like that, wherever that was, and uh, walking around with our little children at the time, we came to the lion's cage, and I didn't realize the lion was there. 
And man, when when that thing roared, and I didn't know the lion was there, I wasn't expecting it. I tell you, it's enough to make you faint dead away. Well, the angel speaks. His voice is like the intimidating roar of a lion, but the resounding echo is what's important here. The angel speaks in a lion-like voice, but there are seven thunders that answer back, and this is the voice of God. Seven thunders. And this is representative of what? God's sovereignty, because seven equals a perfect or a complete number. So you have this intimidating voice of the angel announcing the judgment of God coming, and the echo from heaven of what seems like thunder or seven thunders, complete thunder, the biggest thunder you've ever heard. And it speaks of his omnipotence as this thunder, any thunder, is the most uncontrollable sound that you can ever experience. You have no control over the thunder, do you? It also, the meaning here is that the time of the judgment is going to be short because of God's power, God's invincible, God's incontrovertible, unconquerable power. God does not need a whole lot of time to overcome evil. He's going to do it in an instant. So in an instant, seven years, um, it's going to be a shortened time. But it's also a sealed time. Look at verse 4 with me. When the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying, Keep secret what the seven thunders said, and do not write it down. John, the beloved apostle, is being a good stenographer here. He's about to write down what God said in his thunderous voice, the seven thunders in response to the angel's roar, and the spirit prohibits it. You know, God knows what we need to hear. He knows what we ought to know and when it's appropriate for him to share it with us. When our granddaughter, Chelsea, was just a toddler, she was playing on the floor one time during one of our visits, and I got down on the floor to play with her, and uh, she wasn't paying attention to me, so I, I simply wanted to tease her a little bit, and I, I leaned over and I said, Chelsea, what time is it? And she didn't skip a beat, she shot back right now. I asked her, what time is it? She said, right now. Well, of course it is. If you're a, a toddler, it's always right now. And you know, that answer was kind of like God's. There are some things that God will not tell us until he's ready. Deuteronomy 29 says that the Lord our God has secrets known to no one. And so all we can do is live in the right now just like Chelsea. When the time is right, God reveals everything. Some, some of the things that you and I want to know are very appropriate questions. They just aren't timely in God's eyes. The main questions that we might have as believers is, uh, or questions really about evil. We, we want to know why is there a devil? <laughs> and why does God allow him to continue? And why does God permit sin? Why does God permit suffering? Why does God permit things like a mountain slide, and a mudslide in India, or a tsunami that takes out 100,000 people? Why does God do that? You remember the story of Robinson Crusoe? He's the fellow that got marooned on an island with a cannibal by the name of Friday. He, uh, he teaches the savage how to behave in a civilized manner. He teaches him all about Christianity. But when Crusoe attempts to instruct Friday about evil and about Satan, the inevitable question comes up. Friday says to Robinson Crusoe, if God much strong, much might is the devil, why God not kill the devil? Seems like an honest question, an honorable question, right? Well, Robinson Crusoe pretended not to hear the question, and what he did was he found some excuse to send Friday on an errand on the other side of the island. Robinson Crusoe had no answer for Friday. We don't know God's ultimate answers for permitting evil and the devil. You know, every time there's a tragedy, and especially if it's connected with the church over the years as I've been serving, I get the question, why? Why did God allow that? Why does God permit this to happen? And you know what? I want to be like Robinson Crusoe. I want to send them on an errand somewhere because I don't have an answer. 
The answer is not to be found. The answer is asked in the book of Job, which is the premier entryway into Scripture, believe it or not. It's the oldest book in the Bible, chronologically speaking. It's the first one ever written. But the question asked over and over and over and over again, and in different ways, but primarily, how could you, God? Does that sound a little edgy to you? Does that sound like somebody who wants God to account for his actions? Remember, I read to you Psalm uh, Job 42, I think it's verse 3, where God says, Who is it that's questioning me? And Job realizes what he's done. He said, It was I. I was speaking of things too important for me, things that I did not know. We don't know God's ultimate answers for permitting evil and the devil. But I think Oswald Chambers comes close. Oswald Chambers is one of my heroes. I love what he's written about living the Christian life. I think he could have given the only appropriate answer to Friday's questions about the secret things of God. And this is what Oswald Chambers wrote. God does not tell us what he is going to do or why. He reveals to us who he is. He does so in his son, doesn't he? Despite the unanswered questions about what, why God does things, there's another, there's a bigger question, why do we question God? I mean, we're the creation. We are not the creator. If God decides to seal up some of the answers for all of eternity, he is God. It's enough to know that God always keeps his promises. So it's going to be a shortened time, and it's going to be a sealed time until God unfolds it and fulfills his promises, which is the next point. It's going to be a time when God fulfills his promises. Look at the next few verses, beginning verse 5. Then the angel I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand toward heaven. He swore an oath in the name of the one who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and everything in them, the earth and everything in it, and the sea and everything in it. And he said, there will be no more delay. This is when all of the answers of God come spilling forth. This is when all of the judgment begins to happen in such a way, set in motion and never to be stopped. We continue to read, when the seventh angel blows his trumpet, God's mysterious plan will be fulfilled. It will happen just as he announced it to his servants, the prophets. The promise of God given to his angel is that the time is going to be short, and that the secrets reserved for himself will be revealed as the plan unfolds. This is just as he spoke it to the prophets and as the prophets spoke it to people generation after generation and as people didn't believe it and killed the prophets generation after generation. God keeps his promises. The time that seals up the secrets is about to end. Which brings us to our last point is that it's a serving time. Verses 8 through 11. Then the voice from heaven spoke to me again, Go, and take the open scroll from the hand of the angel who's sitting, standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel, and I told him to give me the small scroll. Yes, take it and eat it, he said. It will be sweet as honey in your mouth. You know, every Jew understood that expression, sweet as honey in your mouth. The words are described just that way in the Old Testament. He said, yes, take it and eat it. He said, it'll be sweet as honey in your mouth, but it will turn sour in your stomach. So I took the small scroll from the hand of the angel and I ate it. And it was sweet in my mouth, but when I swallowed it, it turned sour in my stomach. Then I was told, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. As the apostle um, at this moment becomes a player in the drama of Revelation. He's told to take the little scroll, the little book of the angel, and eat it. Something is being required of John at this point. 
He has to participate now. He's been a spectator and a stenographer up to this point, but now he is told to participate. This old man, John, John, who has served Jesus for nearly 60 years, watched him die, cared for Jesus' mother. He experiences firsthand the thrill of a victory that is coming, but the agony of getting there. That's the bitter and sweet relationship here. It tells us two things, really, about servanthood. It tells us that it's bitter, and it tells us that it's sweet. What do we mean? Well, serving Christ means knowing the bitterness of judgment. When I first came here as pastor uh, over nine years ago, we're in our tenth year together, I met with the Pastor Parish Committee over in the fellowship hall over there, and they handed me a piece of paper, and on that piece of paper were some of the uh, hopes that the committee had for what the pastor would be like to them. And I will never, I still have the paper, so I could quote it, I could reflect it back to you. It says on there that, basically, let me just encapsulate it, I can't quote the whole statement, but it says something along these lines, that the congregation did not want to hear just platitudes. They didn't want to hear anything that would short change the truth. They wanted the truth, and in order to have the truth, you need the sweetness of the gospel, but you also need to understand the bitterness of the judgment. We have to know what's wrong in order to choose what's right, don't we? And that's what the congregation wanted. I've tried to be true to that. Frankly, if you hadn't want, wanted that, I would have said it anyway. <laughs> you know, I mean, that, that's the calling of ministers to tell the truth. The word of the book tastes sweet, but the pathway is somewhat bitter lined at times. We'll find in the days ahead, as we look through the book of Revelation, there are more bowls and battles and beasts ahead. And when John becomes a player in this drama, his belly turns bitter with the experience. There are a lot of people today that are very curious about prophecy, about the end times. People are fascinated with the Antichrist. They want to know all these things. However, the minute the full truth hits home, it can be like bitterness in the belly. Full truth places bitter demands on our lives. It's the truth of judgment and condemnation. That is a bitter message that the world does not want to hear. You know, frankly, if you want to draw a crowd, you talk about good things that God promises, you can draw a crowd. You talk about the judgment that God offers if you reject him in any way, People don't want to hear that. There is a real hell. There is a real fire. That's a bitter demand. There's an eternal separation from God that awaits those who reject Jesus Christ. That is bitter in the stomach. The full truth is that a disciple of Jesus Christ must pick up a cross. That doesn't sound like an upper, does it? Die. Die to self. Die to the world. Die to the devil. In other words, Jesus Christ has to become first in our life if we're truly going to follow him. That's the full truth. If you want to tell a half-truth, you might be able to draw a crowd. And today, marketing the church, getting people to fill up the church, means hiding the truth, hiding the full truth. It seems that attracting crowds has become our focus rather than proclaiming the truth. And you know what? I don't know about you, but I read it in the scriptures somewhere in my Bible, maybe it's in your Bible too, that in the end, it is the truth that's going to set us free, not having a big crowd. Serving the Lord will open us up to seeing fully the bitterness of judgment. But there is a contrast to the bitterness, and I'm so glad to get to that during this message. There is the sweetness of genuine hope to be found in serving Christ. Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 16. Thy words were found, and I did eat them, and thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. 
Again, in Psalm 119, verse 103, How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. There's a sweetness beyond the judgment. There's a hope that's eternally bound with the judgment. Think about Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a prophet who was told to go and preach a hot, spilling cauldron judgment against the people of Israel because they had sinned against God. They had turned away and they were worshiping idols. Yet, Jeremiah also had a vision of the almond branch of peace. Bitter on the one hand, sweet on the other. John the Baptist preached the sternest message of God's judgment against sin. That's bitter. Yet he pointed to the Savior. What's not sweet about that? Where is the sweetness? Where is the hope? Well, the sweetness and the hope are found in the promise of God for deliverance. The Apostle Paul put it this way in a verse that we're all familiar with. Paul wrote, and we know that all things work together for good, for sweetness, to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. So those who by faith surrender their lives to worship, and serving God are the call of God. Everything, even the judgment of God, works together for people like that. So, finding sweetness and hope in the Word of God means eating the judgment and the deliverance together. Finding it means learning about Him, but it also means leaning on Him. That's where the sweetness of His Word comes in. Debbie, I thought you were going to steal my thunder with, I saw that honey up there, and I saw you had some spoons up there, and I thought to myself, oh man, I'm, I'm going to be too late with this one. But you didn't go that way, route, so I get to say this anyway. But I want you to think about Philip's honey sitting up there, and I want you to think about how your, your lips may have been kind of watered a little bit when you saw that little bottle of honey. I know mine were. I love honey. Anytime I have tea, it goes in there. It goes on ice cream. It goes. Frankly, I would put it on. Uh, I'd put it on spaghetti. You know, I I put it anywhere. I love it. In ancient days, when little Jewish children were learning their alphabet, the rabbis would take a slate and they would write the letters on it, so they could teach the children. But the ink was not the ink that we would think of. The ink was honey. They would take little pieces of dough, bread dough, and they would spread the honey on the dough, put it on the slate. And they would shape the dough into the letters, and they'd show them to the children. The child identified the correct letter. What was the child given to do? Lick the slate clean. You ever wonder where that expression comes from? It's a Jewish expression. Sweet. In spiritual sense, we do the same thing. We open the book of God, don't we? We open that book and we see God's ways. We understand. And what do we do with that word? We ingest it. We take it in. Thy word have I hid my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp to my feet, like to my path. Thy word, thy word. We ingest it. And it changes us. It grows us. We make those words our way of life. And God does give sweetness. One of the reasons I asked Debbie to have the choir sing, the longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. I'm sorry, choir, that I put that on you. Because it's a song that you've obviously never done it before. But isn't that the truth? The more experience you have with the Word of God, the more experience you have with ingesting the Word of God, the more it changes your life. That's the bottom line, my friend. The angel puts John out on the stage with this word, take it and eat it up. The Word is there. You know it's sweet. You know there's bitterness. You, however, are the one who must decide if you're going to take it and eat it. And by the way, it leads us to what is the call and the challenge 
of God to every human being. And many of you are human. Thank you. Here's the challenge to every one of us. God says, do you love me? Or is it sounding off like, like Jesus at the, at the seashore? Do you love me? Let him finish the sentence. Do you love me enough to serve me through the blessing and the hard time, through the sweetness and the bitterness? Father, we do love you. We want to love you enough to serve you at any time. Fill up what is lacking in us, we pray. In Christ's name.